All right, chapter five is one of my favorite chapters, actually. It's short and pretty sweet, so uh, I think you'll like it too. And where we're going now is we're taking the cells that we've learned about and we're putting together to form tissues. So chapter chapter five is about tissues. And if you can learn this chapter, it's gonna really help you in all the other chapters of anatomy because the rest of anatomy is learning about organs and organ systems. And what are those made out of? Well, they're made out of tissue. So um, remember that a tissue is a group of these similar cells working for a common function. And tissues make up organs, right? So the study of tissues is called histology. Ology means the study and hist means tissue. There are four major types that you'll need to know and know them well. Epithelial tissue. Now look at that prefix epi. We've seen that before. It means on top of. So we're going to see this on top uh, like of a surface. So it's going to be um, lining the inside of hollow things or on the outside of things. Um, epithelial tissue. Connective tissue connects the whole body. It's the most common tissue in the body by weight. Muscle tissue, you're probably heard of, and nervous tissue, you've probably heard of. So let's, um, <coughs> excuse me, look at those. So again, epithelial tissue, we're going to see them, and I think there's some blanks in here for your notes, but they cover, they line, um, they're always on the surface of things. Now, they don't have any blood vessels, um, they do quickly divide, so they can um, replenish themselves, but they are for protection, secretion, absorption, excretion. Connective tissue binds and supports and protects and fills up spaces, connects the other tissues together. It can store fat, produce blood cells, and like I said, it's the most widely distributed tissue throughout the body. Um, most have a good blood supply. We'll see some um, exceptions to that. Um, and. and the moral of the story is if you have blood supply at least nearby, you can heal yourself pretty good. But if you lack blood supply, you'll be slow to heal. Muscle, of course, is for moving something. Um, it can be attached to bones to move the bones. It can be inside um, organs to move the stuff within the organ. And of course, in the heart to move blood. And muscles able to contract, you know, uh, from nervous stimulus, really, which brings us to nervous, which conducts impulses to communicate with other cells, to coordinate, to receive information, and decide what to do with it. Um, and we'll find this in your brain and your spinal cord, and then the nerves coming off of those things. And like I said, that is for cellular communication. Now, there are what's called intercellular junctions. Um, if you're from El Dorado or Union County, you probably know, maybe you're from Junction City. It is named Junction City because it is where two states touch, where they come together. Enter, <coughs> like to interact with something. Um, enter means between. Uh, to interact is to act between two people. Um, to interject means to get in between to, you know, uh, an argument maybe. So enter between cellular cells, junction. So we are between cells that are touching. And there's three types. There's the tight junction. And so if you put your hands really tight together, you can actually hold water in your hands. Like if you cupped your hands and you held them close together, um, that's what a tight junction does. It's going to fuse the cell membranes and um, they're able to like prevent things from crossing. An example is in the small intestines. Desmosomes are um, where the cell membranes are just welded together in places. I think about like kind of looks like a pearl snap button. So on a t-shirt, if you have a button down t-shirt, it's not totally sealed like a seam, but it holds it together, but stuff could get through. Like you can put your finger through the place where the buttons aren't. So that's desmosomes. And gap junctions are actually tubular channels that we see, big channels, not channels in the membrane, but channels throughout membrane, multiple membranes to allow things to move from one cell to another very quickly. We don't have to worry about diffusion as much. 
So we see this in muscle cells of the heart and also in our digestive system. And so here's a picture of those intercellular junctions where two cells come between and what's between them. And so if you look at here, this looks like it's been um, sealed together. Think about this. Somebody has put this through a sewing machine and stitched it together. And I mean, if liquid tried to go through here, it would get here and stop because it's just sealed. Um, and so this is a tight junction. Here's one of those desmosomes. So picture this like a button and the snap and they come together. And so stuff could probably get through here pretty easy. It's not sealed, but this is just being very strong. You can see how these um, fibers are actually a part of the cell and, and, and anchor them together. And then you have our gap junctions, which are actual channels. So stuff could go from this cell to the neighboring cell pretty easily. Uh, fun to know nanotechnology. Um, and the blood-brain barrier. So nano is very tiny technology and this is going to help move drugs across the blood-brain barrier. We'll learn about the blood-brain barrier uh, a little bit in our last unit of this course where um, blood actually doesn't enter the brain but there's a barrier that allows diffusion of some things it's very selective on what can go through the brain and this is to protect the brain from toxins and and keep the um the the environment there um highly regulated okay and so what nanotechnology can do is use tiny tiny bits of medication that actually can cross that barrier and so um, they use what's called phospholipid bu bubbles because the brain barrier doesn't see them as toxins and can put the drugs inside that normally would not be able to cross the barrier. Um, another example is they have insulin that now can be inhaled. And so these tiny, tiny, tiny particles can go through the skin and get into the bloodstream instead of being injected. Pretty cool. Not going to be tested on it, but neat to know. So let's start with our first tissue, the epithelial tissue. And remember, epi means on top of. So this is covering organs or on the body surface like your skin um, or inside your nose. Uh, it's going to line cavities and hollow organs, so the inside of the stomach and also um, inside the, the stomach cavity, right? And we're going to find glands there at the surface. And what you're always going to see with epithelial tissue is there's a free surface on the outside. It's the top layer or the bottom layer, whichever way you turn the picture. But there's space on one side. And then on the other is what's called a basement membrane. And the basement membrane, like a basement in a house, is always on the very bottom of the epithelium. And I'm going to show this to you in these pictures and you're going to be like, oh my God, this is the easiest thing we've learned all week because <laughs> we've only been in class a week. So, well, if you're in a mini semester, you know, if you're in another semester, you've been here a while. So the one thing about epithelial tissue though is they are avascular. A in front of any word or an, like asexual means without sex. So avascular is without blood vessels. And so the nutrients have to diffuse to the tissues from the blood supply in the underlying connective tissue. Um, but epithelial tissue is normally very thin, so they can get the oxygen and the nutrients from the blood supply without issue. And those cells do divide and injuries do heal rapidly. The cells we're going to find are really tightly packed and they're named based on their cell shape and the number of cell size. These names are going to make you feel so smart, but it's really easy to understand. Because one way they name these epithelial tissues are based on the shapes of the cells. Are they really flat, like squashed cells? We're gonna call those squamous. Are they cube-shaped or cuboidal? Oid always means kinda like, so they're kinda like a cube. And then columnar cells are the tall or longer cells. So we're gonna go, oh, squamous or cuboidal or columnar. And you're gonna be have to identify these based on how they looked and you're gonna be like, yes, give me more of those questions on the test. Okay, layers. Well, there's really two, and then there's like a fake one. Simple. The simplest thing would be one, right? So a simple 
epithelial is just a one layer of cells. So how would you name things? If I said simple cuboidal, that would mean there's one layer of cells and they're all cube shaped. Or what if I said simple squamous? That's one layer, but they're all really flat. The other option is stratified. Strata means layer. Um, in fact, if you're in geology and you're looking at rocks and you look at a, a cut through, like when you're going to Arkadelphia or whatever, and you drive through that area where they've cut the road through the, like, I hate to say mountain, but mini mountain, and you can see all these layers of different colors rock. Those are actually called strata. So strata means layer. Stratified has more than one layer, okay? so two or more layers of cells. So if I had said stratified columnar, they're tall cells, but there's not just one layer of tall cells, there's more than one layer of tall cells. Uh, we could say stratified squamous, like our skin, our dermis of our skin is stratified squamous, many layers of flattened cells. And then there's pseudo stratified. We don't see this very often, it's usually pseudostratified columnar. I've never seen pseudostratified anything else. So you can make a note on this slide. Pseudostratified columnar is what you're really going to see. So pseudo means false. You might have heard of pseudoscience or pseudopod. So that's false stratified or false layered. So it looks layered, but it's really one layer. And so um, we'll look at some pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue in just a minute. Did you catch all that? Pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Looks layered, but it's not column shaped cells and they line or cover surfaces and organs. All right, so simple squamous. Can you picture what that looks like? It's flat cells and just one layer. And remember, structure still determines function. So if you're super thin and there's only one layer of you, things are going to be able to pass very quickly through you. And that is where we see in our air sacs of our alveoli, in our lungs, and in capillaries where we want diffusion to happen. Now, because they're so thin, they're delicate and can be easily damaged. But these places are highly protected. You know, they're very internal and they do allow diffusion and fil filtration to occur. Like I mentioned, they're in your air sacs and capillaries. These will also uh, line blood vessels and lymphatic um, vessels, which we'll learn about um, in AMP2. <laughs> simple cuboidal, simple, single layer, cuboidal, cube shaped. These are usually for secretion absorption. And so uh, we see them lining kidney tubules and thyroid follicles. There's some ducts um, from glands and Simple cuboidal epithelial actually covers the ovaries. That's kind of unique, right? So here's a cartoon picture of it right here. Now, what I want you to see is this is the free surface. So look in the real picture of the microscope. This is the free surface. What do I mean? There's space here, like there's fluid here or air or what have you. And this is the one flat cell and the one flat cell and the one flat. It's a single layer from the surface down. Notice these cells don't look like this layer. They're connective tissue actually. So this is simple squamous epithelium. Now, if you look at it from the top, they look like this. You're looking down from this free surface on the top and they um, they appear differently. Now, if you look at the cartoon, here's the free space. This dark line here is that what membrane? What's at the very bottom of your house? The, well, not my house, but maybe your house, is the basement. So this is the basement membrane. And if you can think about that helps the epithelial tissue to stick to the connective tissue underneath, that will work. All right, look at these shell, cell shapes. These are not squashed. These are kind of cube shaped. So this is our simple cuboidal. Here's that basement. Here's the free surface. And so this is looking actually in some kidney tubules, I believe. And if you look, like here's one tube. Here's the free surface. Here's the single layer of cube cells going around that basement. And you can kind of see the basement. There's a good picture of it right there. It goes all the way around and those cells are stuck to it. So here is the free surface within the tube. Same thing here is the single layer of cuboidal cells. 
simple columnar cells. Remember, they're single layer, they're elongated. Now, the nuclei we're usually gonna see about the same level, they're gonna be near the basement. And sometimes these have those microvilli we learned about, or the hairy cilia. Sometimes these cells are called goblet cells. And I think about a, oh, sorry, that was touch screen and I touched it. I think about a goblet holding uh, a fluid and, and usually fluid that we release from epithelial is some sort of mucus. So goblet cells, when you hear about those, think of mucus. And so simple columnar epithelia are usually for secreting some mucus or something that, or absorption, which is why you'd have microvilli and cilia, well, microvilli to increase the surface area, and then cilia might be to like move things along. We see this in our uterus, we uh, see this in the stomach and in the intestines. And, and think about it, in the intestines, stomach, we are needing to absorb some things and as well secrete some stuff. Here's our pseudostratified. Remember that false layered columnar epithelium? It is actually a single layer, but it's going to look layered. Um, now, what's different about simple column and, and pseudostratified columnar because right simple columnar is one layer and so is pseudostratified columnar but the difference is the nuclei aren't going to be all at the same level they're going to be at multiple levels and that's what helps give it this layered look the cells do vary kind of in shape they're still elongated but they might like uh, be skinny at one part or fat at another but the key is every single one of these touch the basement so they're all it's just one layer they often do have cilia or a goblet cells and they usually are for help um, fighting infection in your respiratory um, passageway so look at these two cells both of them are actually single layered so this one is the simple columnar epithelial and so you can see here's the basement here's one cell uh, they have some little microvilli to increase the surface area and so this is like in the intestine so we can do more absorption more surface area and it's just one layer and all the nuclei are about the same le level here you see a goblet cell notice it's going to secrete some mucus um, to help you know uh, move the the fecal matter along or whatever Let's look at the pseudo stratified columnar. Here's your basement. If you look, I mean, eat, look at this cell. Go from the top and you follow it all the way. It actually does touch the basement. So does this one. And, you know, barely. It's not a great picture, but all of them do come into contact with the basement, even if it's a small, small, tiny part and their nuclei are just in different layers and so that's why it looks layered and again you might have some goblet cells secreting mucus and you might have some cilia on there um, and this is a great microscopic view of that look at these goblet cells gonna secrete mucus I think that looks really cool and so where's the basement right here this thin line dividing these cells and this connective tissue looking cells at the bottom so those are all our simple. Let's go to stratified. What does stratified mean? Many layers. What does simple mean? One layer. So stratified, squamous, many cells. We're going to have thick layers. Now, squamous epithelium, we learned, if you just have one layer, it's very delicate. But if you have multiple layers, it can be very protective. And you've got to look, when you're looking at stratified epithelium, you've got to look at the outermost cells, the ones closest to the free surface. They're going to tell you the shape because all of them at the basement kind of look cuboidal. Okay. So, um, on stratified squamous epithelium, the new cells are made close to the basement and then they push the cells up and outward so the oldest cells are going to be on the outside and usually they like are dead and so you can just slough them off. And this is for places where you have a lot of friction like oral cavity when you eat, you know, potato chips. Man, those can really uh, rub you the wrong way, right? Like, have you ever swallowed a potato chip and didn't chew it very well? Ouch! But you have all this layers of simple squamous epithelium or this many layers of squamous epithelium that you can afford to lose some of them. The vagina uh, should have some friction if you're having sex and the anal canal will have friction when you are constipated and have to push waste out. <laughs> um, so that's fun to talk about, right? 
Let's go to the next one, stratified cuboidal epithelium. Many layers, so more than one anyway, and they're cubed, and where are you looking at the top layer, the top layer is cubed. And they pretty much do what simple cuboidal epithelium tissue does, but it's more protection than one layer. So we see this in mammary sweat and salivary glands and the pancreas. Um, I did, I'm not gonna test you on the pancreas, so I think I deleted that in your fill in the blank. You can write it in if you want to. OMG, look at all the layers. Here's the basement membrane way down here. Can you tell these cells are related and these cells are very different? So these are connective tissue and then your basement layer is holding on all these other layers. Now notice these are all funky shapes. So where are we gonna look to determine the set shape? We can see it's many layers. You look right here at the top and you can see they're flat. So these are stratified squamous. This is stratified too. Here's the basement. Remember, this is the free surface. The basement's not on the top, the basement's on the bottom. These are obviously different types of tissue. So here's our basement at the bottom and we have more than one layer going towards the free surface. And we're gonna look at the top and they're pretty cube shaped. And this is a salivary gland. All right, stratified columnar epithelial is not very common. Um, some of the ducts of exocrine glands in the urethra of the male, um, of course the cube shaped shells are close to the membrane, uh, basement membrane deeper, but the top layer will look elongated. And then there's this unique one called transitional epithelium. We're not gonna use this word, we'll use transitional. And when you transition, you change. Now, these are gonna be a type of stratified epithelium. There's many cell layers, but there's different shapes depending on how much tension. So what happens is you can have kind of cube-shaped cells. Think about a, like a, a balloon. If the balloon is empty, the balloon is thicker. But as you blow the balloon up, the, the balloon cells, if you will, would change shape. They wouldn't be thick, they're gonna thin out. And so your cells can become stretched and elongated. And this allows stretching of that actual tissue. So it is forming a barrier, but it can expand. And where do you need this? Your bladder, right? Have you ever, oh my gosh, had to pee? And you can feel that stretching. Those stretch receptors are telling you, hey, your bladder's full, go urinate. Your ureters also allow you to um, stretch a little bit and as well as the urethra. So, but I always think of the bladder. So here we have our stratified columnar, and so basement membrane and more than one cells. Know the, notice the bottom cells does look cuboidal, but the top is columnar. And then we have our transitional. Now both of these are the same tissue, and so what you see is the basement membrane here, and here's all these layers, here's all these layers, but this is with the, let's say like the bladder that is empty, and then we filled up the bladder, and they've the bladder is expanded and, and have been allowed to stretch out. So here are all the epithelial tissues you've just learned, okay? There's a lot of them, but the names are easy, right? If it's simple, it's one layer. If it's stratified, it's more than one layer. And then you've got pseudostratified, which is kind of look layered, but it's really simple, and transitional, which is layered, but looks different depending on the stretchability. And so these are your layers. It describes, or the epithelial tissues, a description, what they are doing, and where you will find them. So this would be a good page to like ear tag or mark. Okay, glandular epithelium. Remember I told you a lot of these epithelial um, layer, layer or tissues make up glands. And so I do wanna to talk to you about glands. And gl there are two types in our body. There's endocrine glands that secrete tissue or fluid into, they stay in the blood body, so they might go into the fluid around the cells or actually into the blood. And then there's exocrine. Endo means inside, exo means outside. Crin means, um, I believe, chemical. But, ugh, I would have to look it up. But endo, stay inside, exo, get it out. So it actually secretes into a duct. Endocrine glands are ductless. They do not have a duct, just your exocrine. What is a duct? Think about your air duct. It's a passageway for your air to move. Well, this is a passageway for the chemical to move out of the body to the surface, whether that be into the stomach, because that's eventually, like, technically inside your stomach isn't in your body. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, like all those mucus glands, maybe. Um, 
like exocrine gland, uh, tear ducts, things like that. And there are structurally two types of exocrine glands. There can be unicellular, which means they're made of one cell. We've seen a goblet cell. Remember what goblet cells do? They secrete mucus. And it's just one cell, and it's secreting fluid out, um, exocrine. And then there's multicellular, where you make multi, many cells. And um, this is going to make up other types of glands, like sweat and salivary glands. And they can be different shapes. So you can have a simple or a compound tubule alveolar. I don't really test on this stuff. So you can put a little X here, but you will see this stuff tested. So there's types of glandular secretion. So we're still talking about exocrine glands, which are glands that it release fluid out of the body through a duct. There's merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. I'm gonna give you an easy way to remember this. And I hope you're, I mean, think about the people who don't listen to the lecture. I bet they struggle, right? Because I'm telling you what's on the test and how to remember stuff, and they're just having to come up with that on their own. Good luck to them. All right, merocrine. I think of Mary is a happy cell. Merocrine. Oh, they're so happy because the cell stays in place, and they release fluid by exocytosis. Remember that process? Bulk transport out of the cell. So this is going to not get rid of any of the cell. The cell is going to stay intact and release fluid through exocytosis. And so it's going to release things, and I don't know why pancreas is here. Um, maybe this is where I deleted pancreas. You know, just scratch that out. It, I think it's talking about pancreatic glands, but let's focus on salivary and sweat. Well, how are sal salivary, your spit, and sweat the same? They're both clear fluids. And so I think about merocrine or happy cells because they're not losing any part of themselves they're just releasing the fluid and it's clear so you're clear fluids apocrine glands a piece of the cell is released see what i did there a piece merocrine happy cells staying in place a piece of the cell is lost so a small piece of the cell actually gets sloughed off during secretion so you're not going to have clear fluids anymore you're going to have um like white fluids. So mammary glands make milk and then ceraminous glands um, is earwax. I don't know if that's why it's kind of yellow. Uh, some people have really gross earwax. Earwax is one thing that really bleh, grosses me out. But epicrine, a piece of the cell's lost. Holocrine, the whole cell is lost. OMG, the whole cell breaks apart and uh, that's going to be your sebaceous gland. Make a note, sebaceous glands release sebum, S-E-B-U-M. That is just another name for oil. So these are your oil glands. And think about the whole glands loss. It's going to be super oily. All right. So let's see what that looks like. Here's these structural types that I told you um, I'm not going to test you on. Now, all of these are multicellular, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we were talking about unicellular, we just, this one cell, like the goblet cell. But this is simple. This is a uh, simple branch. This is simple coils, simple branch alveolar. So simple meaning one duct. And then you have compound um, tubular and compound alveoli. Don't expect to see a lot of that. All right, so this is type simple compound. Um, again, I would put an X through this. But star this one, Merocrine. Remember the happy cells? Look, they're just <laughs> squirting out fluids um, using exocytosis, and so they're clear fluids like saliva and sweat. Apocrine, actually pieces of the cell, a piece of the cell breaks off, and so this is gonna be mammary glands, and uh, ceraminous glands. And then holocrine, the whole cell breaks off. And so look, you better replace those cells with mitosis. And that's going to be your sebe se uh, sebum, your sebaceous glands, the oil glands. And here you see oil associated with the hair follicle in the skin. Okay, we're actually pausing here for our first video. I kept it right under 30 minutes, and then we'll do another video for the second half of this chapter, and you'll be done with chapter five. Whoop, whoop.